everyone. Thank you for coming to today's GIC talk. My name is Soiki, and today's GIC talk host. I'm very glad to be here as today's host. Uh, before we get started, please put your cell phone on silent mode. Thank you. So let me introduce to Jonathan Chiarella, today's GIC talk speaker. His GIC talk is in, entitled U.S. Control of ROK Forces. Jonathan is going to talk about the late handover of the control in 2004, which has deep meaning about relationship between Korea and America. <coughs> when you first arrive, you should have uh, received a slip of paper like this one. You are welcome to write down your questions on this paper, which will be answered by Jonathan during our Q&A portion of the, today's judge talk, which led by one of our English-speaking volunteers. So now, without any further hesitation, please welcome Jonathan with applause. Good afternoon. Uh, today I took a look at the paper. Uh, for those of you who know Korean, uh, the headline uh, should be a topic that has been coming up uh, quite a bit, and that's the THAAD missile defense system. Uh, for English-only speakers, uh, THAAD is the name of a, quote, missile defense network that the U.S. has been uh, pushing strongly uh, uh, Starting to the point where a uh, former uh, um, a former U.S. FK U.S. Forces Korea commander said it was excessive. Uh, you had the you had the uh, new ambassador come in a couple years ago, and they've been pushing that and with the latest uh, North Korean missile test, um, nuclear bomb test. Uh, the topic has come up again, and it is something that China has opposed. This is something that ties in to my topic, and I will back to it. So, first off, uh, what is OPCON? Uh, OPCON is the Operation of Control of Military Forces. In the 1950, uh, the president of South Korea at the time, Lee Sin Man, uh, handed over operational control of the Republic of Korean military to the UN, and the UN, for, uh, the UN in Korea has been always the U.S., in the U.S. strictly now at this point. You don't see a large Polish condition, condition. So I didn't forget Poland. Uh, they're just not present. And it's been a U.S. commander ever since. So uh, East and Mine did that, and the U.S. has had control of that. Uh, however, though, uh, the, the U.S. did uh, work out an agreement where uh, the Korean president is in control of forces during peacetime. So the current arrangement, peacetime command, it comes from the Republic of Korea Joint Chiefs of Staff, and that goes to the troops, and um, and the and the American forces are under the American command. However, there's a, a unified command here. You have the Security Consultative Meeting, uh, which meets every February, and you have the uh, Military Committee. Now, it is bilateral, but there's a very obvious and clear uh, domination by the U.S. in this, and also in the fact that they have operational control. So they exert influence on that. And then you have the Combined Forces Command, uh, which will uh, give orders to the uh, uh, land forces, naval forces, air forces, and marines and during wartime. And that's one command giving our Korean and U.S. forces the same war So they'd be together uh, following Basically, they'll be following the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff and Department of Defense, which goes to the American president. And so in wartime, the American president called the shots, not the Korean president. Either one. After the transfer, if there is a successful transfer of the wartime operational control, it's not happened yet, but if there, if there were, then you would have the Salt City meeting remain, and you would have a military coordinating committee, and that would have wartime planning. So you'd have something like uh, NATO or other UN forces where 
there's discussion back and forth, um, and that gives principles, but at the end of the day, though, the captains, the generals who get the final call would be of the respective countries. So the Koreans would control Korean troops, and the Americans would control the American troops. And this would exist as guiding principles that can coordinate efforts, but each would operate under its own sovereign command. So you had the peacetime Akhan uh, restoration, and you had uh, you had negotiations between uh, Tutu and and uh, George Bush and Clinton, and they uh, they finally signed uh, that agreement shortly after uh, Clinton was inaugurated. Uh, Noteu first floated the idea uh, when he was running for uh, president in 1957. And that was significant for being the first election of the Sixth Republic, the first Democratic uh, election possibly ever. A bit flawed uh, election. There was no runoff. Noteu was not the most popular candidate. Uh, there was a four way split. But though, he represented the right most wing. If you were to like, lay out the candidates, no two was on the right, the most conservative, probably the most pro-American candidate. And even he was saying, we need to get OpCon under, under us. We need to have the authority of our own troops again. So he campaigned for that in his pledges at least. So this isn't some crazy out of left field, you know, like North Korean lackey, evil commie spy idea. It has become something that has been Associated with with uh, with people who are idealistic, uh, too nationalist, this and that. But it's like, hey, you know, a little history lesson. Uh, no to you, as you know, like the uh, the second in command of the Chun Doo Hwan dictatorship, and Chun Doo Hwan's big successor uh, was campaigning on a uh, promise of getting all the operation control back to Korea, all of it, peacetime and wartime. And he got 37% of the vote, and the other candidates were to the left of that. So it's very interesting. If you look at uh, American politics, you had Obamacare. And it was like, oh, Obama's a socialist. Well, Obamacare was Mitt Romney care. And before Mitt Romney, it was Bob Dole's plan. And before Bob Dole, the Heritage Foundation the Heritage Foundation is a very, very, very right-wing think tank in America. It denies global warming is a thing. They are just way out there, right-wing. And the Heritage Foundation came up with Obamacare. So what Obama's done is what the right-wing did in, um, in the early 90s, and now it's considered a left-wing socialist crazy thing. Similar thing for OpCon. No to you says it, it's cool, and now it's like, whoa, you're crazy communists, well, how can you say that? We need America, we need all the American help we can get. So that changed. Um, Kim Yun Song and Joe Clinton, they had the execution of the transfer. Uh, look at that, only a uh, two-year gap only uh, from the negotiations to the final sign over and you got to the, oops, you got to the current regime. Next, there was the remaining wartime operational control and there was a lot of momentum, and that momentum was a bit spent in the peacetime. So it's okay, you know, small victory, take a breather. Uh, but in the uh, in the early 21st century, uh, America's reputation was uh, very poor, and it was a very good opportunity for uh, progressives, uh, especially within Korea, where there had been uh, numerous uh, bad incidents with the U.S. forces. That's like, hey we can bring up this uh, idea and get a lot of uh, support. Uh, and that was, you know, that's what I thought too. I was like, okay, that's, it was a reaction. Not so much, because uh, Bush himself was actually quite keen to hand over operational control. So, get to. So you had negotiations from 2006 to 2007. Uh, Noam Yuhan was elected in, when was it, uh, 2000, 2002, so he took office early 2003. Uh, three years into his administration, started negotiations. Deal was signed again at the security consultative meeting that meets every February, and that was in 2007. And the date of the handover was to be December 2012. Strangely enough, though, um, uh, Bush himself actually wanted it to be done in December of 2009. 
So I thought, wow, the Koreans really had to fight to get the, you know, the wartime operation control back. And I was like, wow, I can't believe Bush let it go. Because we know Bush is such a, you know, he's the most extreme war-like president Amer America's ever had. And it's easy to fall into that trap of thinking, but you know, there's a bit more to it than that. So uh, you had your first delay in the restoration of Opcom. Uh, in 2010, um, so skirmishes is the way to put it. Uh, very, uh, you can't say war, it wasn't a full scale war, but uh, uh, there was uh, some two big incidents. And that was the sinking of the, uh, the Chonan, uh, which is a corvette in the Republic of Korea <coughs> Navy. Uh, the opinion on it has been uh, pretty much divided between allies of the US and allies of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea aka North Korea. There has not been a multilateral investigation, and I'm not an expert on it, uh, but the international uh, journal uh, called the Journal of Applied Geophysics uh, carried an article, and this was an English language international um, uh, paper, uh, articles by uh, Korean professors saying that the Chang'an probably hit a friendly mine. If I hit one of its own mines, and that it wasn't a North Korean attack. There has been other, um, there's been other like criticisms of the official investigation. Uh, you had uh, the uh, there was writing on the on some of the on some of the shrapnel, which matched um, the South Korean style of Korean, not the North Korean style. Uh, there's an official where it was a matter of you know was it ear hole or ear <laughs> So uh, I I can't say conclusively, but. Uh, I, I don't think that we, there's just been a proper investigation. It uh, doesn't change things a whole lot now, what happened, but there is room for doubt. Um, so they, uh, they had an, a, an agreement uh, in the summer to transfer the, uh, to delay the transfer of operational control another three years from original day between Emin Abaki and Barack Obama. Now, uh, this, this was in 2010, so this is, this is Obama's first administration, but I think it's important to see that uh, he was starting to become second-term Obama. And second-term Obama, I guess you could say uh, he, maybe the, the true goals came out. Uh, a lot of his policy hasn't changed qualitatively, but he has moved from the Afghan surge and from, or at least putting his spin on, hey, I'm mopping up George Bush's mess here. He went from that to being like, okay, now that I've done that and I've won the PR battle and everyone's declaring that dance had success, I've got Petraeus, you know, everyone's saying, oh, wow, George is so great. Now I can do what I want to do. Uh, he wasn't coming out with the pivot to Asia yet, but he was probably thinking about it. So they had that delay. Uh, then in November, you had the uh, Yunpyeong Island shelling. So this delay came before the clear, there was a clear attack by North Korea upon, upon uh, Yunpyeong Island, which is in the outer reaches of Incheon. That attack came after the delay. So this delay um, was predicated on the Chan sinking, not on the Yunpyeong Island um, attack, which interestingly uh, was a sign of North Korea's uh, weakness. There's lots of things about North Korea indicate weakness, um, much like a, a cornered tiger lashing out or, or, or somebody very desperate. Uh, the the Young <coughs> Island incident, uh, the shelling, the attack North Korea did, the surprise attack, that was upon uh, a mixture of military and civilian buildings. But the civilian buildings they hit were former military ones, which indicates that the North Koreans were running off of very, very old intelligence. So they're like, oh, we're gonna, we you know we have the new leader, Kim Jong, you know, we're gonna have the new leader, Kim Jong-un. We need to show that we're not weak at this transition time. So let's attack those things. But they attacked former military uh, buildings that were now like, you know, a CU or 7-Eleven, that kind of stuff. So it indicated that like, oh, well, they attacked us, but like, hey, they obviously have bad intelligence. They've got 40-year-old intelligence. Uh, also the, also, the response was uh, heavily criticized uh, for being too slow. Uh, one of the interesting things that, caught, uh, that, that I saw was that America was no help. A lot of times they say, oh, you know, having the Afcon, 
in American hands, having America take care of certain things and be on alert for war, that makes America more able to help out. Uh, actually, at the in 2010, when there were when there was these incidents, uh, the American commander uh, quite annoyingly talked to the Korean one. Uh, he's like, "Just do whatever you want. It's your country. It's your problem." Uh, when the Korean commander was following protocol and asking, "Like, can we use?" Like you know, can we can we bring some warplanes in for, for reconnaissance on the northern side? And the Americans were not really. There was kind of like, don't bother us with this crap attitude, which was a bit uh, shocking. Uh, the response was also really slow, um, too. And, and what will prevent another one will be what happened uh, late this past year. Uh, South Korea installed better surveillance systems and monitoring systems on in outer Incheon. So. Now, uh, South Korea will be able to respond much more quickly. And it's not because of American OPCOM that South Korea can now respond more quickly, but because they've finally installed monitoring stations on the outer reaches of Incheon, which they didn't have before. So, if you want to protect Koreans from a North Korean attack, we just, you know, let's just say North Korea is evil, awful. We, no matter what we, we do, we just got to make sure we're uh, ready for it. If that's the case, and you know, and you believe that, then you would want more monitoring stations out there. How Optime prevents another one of these, I don't know. It's always assumed that they always just think that you'll fill in the blanks yourself. Like, oh yeah, well, gee, North Korea is still a threat, so we obviously need America. And none of this has to do with American withdrawal. This is about America handing over authority and letting Koreans do certain things themselves. It's not about full-scale abrogation of the alliance. Uh, I'm not talking about a full ending of the alliance today. That's an interesting topic, but I'm not even talking about that. It's just operational control. And again, that's wartime operational control. So the things North Korea has done, whether it be the mining, uh, the, the planning the mine on the DMZ, that happened during peacetime. So how wartime operational authority deters these events, I don't know. And it obviously has not deterred these events. It's not prevented them. North Korea has to be like, oh, geez, America's had operational control. We better be careful. That's not been the case. Uh, last, uh, oh, sorry, a year ago, from last October, so a year and two months ago, you had the effective death of the Bush Road deal, and the Bach and Obama administration signed a deal saying that, you know, we're just going to delay this transition until the 2020s sometime. So there's no end time. It's like probably the 2020s. But it's not like environmental policies. You know, when the presidents of whatever country go up say, by 2100 we're going to cut emissions by 99%. And it's like, that, that's meaningless. That is absolutely meaningless. You'll be dead by then. We'll, we'll, we'll all be dead. I don't care about their promises. Way down the line that are vague, non, non-binding. So it's basically a non-binding agreement. And it has to be renegotiated between the ROK and the US. So basically, it's, it's not any agreement at all, because it says even before there is a transfer, we have to have another meeting to renegotiate the terms of a transfer. So this didn't really delay the Bush Road deal. It, it basically just ripped up that agreement and, and just it's nothing. And it says that uh, there's emerging threats, um, that South Korea is not ready, and there's a need for missile defense. Um, America has been banging on about missile, missile, missile defense. Um, it will be interesting how ineffective they are, which I'll get to. But uh, America is making a FAD or a Korean made missile system, but probably FAD, a precondition. So they have to have another deal worked out. Uh, at the earliest, it would be mid 2020s, by mutual agreement and there's vague clauses about Korea being ready to defend itself, which, you know, it's basically just, there's no there's no agreement at all. Um, China North Korea. Well, who was surprised? A lot of talk has been about, oh, North Korea, China. Oof, wow. They came out of nowhere. Uh, something I want to um, ask. Does anybody know when North Korea did its first uh, nuclear missile test? Um, sorry, nuclear bomb test? First nuclear bomb test. That was in 2006. That was before the deal. So when people say, oh, you know, it was one thing to have Afghan go to Korea. 
and have Koreans control Korean forces. That was one thing back then, but now North Korea has nuclear weapons. Oh my god. They had nuclear weapons in 2006. So, I don't know how you can say that's a reason for delaying the, 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 the transfer of authority. So they're saying, no, North Korea has nuclear weapons. Like, yes, they have always had nuclear weapons since day one of this agreement. They have always had them. How is that a new reason? That's not a new development. That has always been the case. So the relevance of it is a bit suspicious. Their most recent test, uh, which they claim is a hydrogen bomb, there's doubts that they were able to successfully detonate a hydrogen bomb. But uh, and even if it was a hydrogen bomb, I'm on board with uh, neo-realists like Kenneth Waltz and the Federation of American Scientists and other nuclear scientists. Um, it doesn't make a difference if it's a conventional atomic bomb or a hydrogen bomb. It's it's. That, that's a bridge that nobody wants to cross. Nobody wants to start a nuclear war, because when you start a nuclear war, all bets are off. It doesn't matter if it's 10 megatons or 100 megatons. It's, once a nuclear war breaks out, like that's kind of end. That could be the end of everything. Uh, for example, in the Korean War, um, if, if uh, MacArthur got his way, he wanted to drop nuclear bombs um, along the Yalu River, uh, the border between the Korean Peninsula and China. If he got his wish for all the bombs that he wanted to drop, uh, it would be sort of all animal life on Earth. He wanted to drop cobalt. So if we cross into nuclear war, it doesn't really matter. Like it's we're, we're all kind of like screwed. So the whole point of nuclear weapons is to be make people careful and a mutual deterrence, realistically. So whether they test the hydrogen, um, it's also a sign that they are not doing so well. If North Korea is investing all this time in atomic weapons, it's because they have nothing else to do. They need a deterrent. They do not have the, the forces. They don't have well-fed forces. They don't have the forward deployment. Their submarines are aging and awful. Like all their equipment is, is awful. They have no they have no strong base. If they start a war, if they're involved in a war, they're going to run through their supplies in a matter of months. They are nowhere near where they were compared to South Korea in 1950. It's a completely different thing. They are pushing for this, these nuclear things because they are so weak. Because that's, that's their, that's their uh, ace in the hole. Is they can say, hey, be careful, because if you cross us, you might start a nuclear war. That's all they have. They don't have massive force to invade anyone or anything. So. If there is a war that breaks out and we and you do give control over to America, I mean, what does it change? If there's a nuclear war that breaks out, a nuclear war breaks out, and it doesn't matter who's in operational control. So uh, the biggest problem is, you know, uh, the nuclear bomb. Uh, but having America control the South Korean troops during wartime doesn't stop a nuclear bomb. And if North Korea does do a nuclear bomb, it's like the U.S. taking over operational control doesn't change the fact that a nuclear war has begun. Uh, actually, according to uh, an index here, this was, uh, I can't remember where I, maybe Bloomberg or something, I got, I got uh, this, this was reported, um, Global Fire Index, this came out uh, a couple years ago, and it shows the strongest military forces. Of course, U.S., number one, you know, USA way to go. Uh, number one in a lot of things, or at least near the top, um, Russia, leading back to World War II, they've always had a very strong tank contingent. Then next is the uh, is the PRC, uh, which with its massive population has the most soldiers. Uh, you'll see that um, you'll see that North Korea is way down here at 35, and here's South Korea is at number nine. So some people actually rate South Korea higher. I spoke with a uh, confidentiality agreement. I, I spoke with uh, somebody who was a very high ranking uh, within the US forces Korea during the Bush years. And he said, I'm going to have to keep this confidential who it was, he said that he places South Korea above any of the NATO allies in terms of his expertise and ability to wage warfare if he thinks it's it should be above 
you know, France, Germany, UK, certainly above Turkey, I, I'd say, I think, to be honest. North Korea is, uh, yeah, down here at 35. Uh, they have the most submarines. They have the most submarines of any, of any military in the world. But a third of those submarines are diesel powered. Not a single submarine in the U.S. forces is diesel powered. They've all been nuclear for years now. So that means they're quiet. Uh, these ones, these are diesel powered, and these are old 1970s style Soviet subs. A third of them. So these are like old rust buckets here. Like a diesel powered submarine in 2016 now, the, the uh, Romeo class submarines. That's pitiful. So they have the highest numbers, and the, uh, the report by the uh, think tank actually said that North Korea should, would be lower. If you took into account North Korea's uh, the health of their soldiers, and you took into account the quality of their equipment, they would actually be even lower. So um, in any case, they're well below South Korea. Uh, they have more people, uh, but a lot of it's reserve. So they got a lot more people on, on the, you know, the numbers, but it doesn't translate into a whole lot. Okay, uh, the missile range. One of the reasons why I think that America is more concerned and has been wanting to get involved more is because uh, the missiles have been able to reach out here. Now, South, uh, North Korea has been able to attack the South uh, for a very long time. So when it says new missiles, it doesn't mean they're more able to hit South Korea. If they wanted South Korea, they'll be able to. And they can, it's, you can't really stop, it's just short range that they launch one. It's not like, there it goes, stop it. It's more like, that's it. So this, I think, is clearly an indication of, they're looking for deterrence. They're looking for a way to be like, hey, you know, if somebody invades us, we'll attack back with a, with a missile, maybe with a nuclear tip for it. But, I think they look on that as a last resort. North Korea would be pummeled in, in any war. They would be absolutely pummeled. So, you know, it's like you have a hostage, and nuclear weapon is your gun. If you kill your hostage, you have nothing. You, need, you have the gun pointed at the hostage, and you say, stop, or I'll shoot. But you don't want to do it right away. You, you do that as like an absolute last resort. And even when the time comes, you still might not do it. You might give one more chance. Well, I'll give you one more chance, but then I'll really kill this person. Because once you kill the hostage, once you start the war, you've got no trump card. That's it. You, you use it. <clears throat> so, one of the principles, mutually assured destruction. Um, not infallible. Uh, there was the famous uh, movie, Dr. Strangelove, about how things could break down. There could be accidents. There could be somebody crazy. But... We've, we've had nuclear weapons uh, for decades now, and we haven't had we haven't had major disasters. There are a lot of uh, we've had disasters with nuclear power plants, but not with the weapons themselves. Uh, we we have many uh, as humans, we have many structures of command. We have many ways to prevent uh, to prevent using them too quickly. All of this changes. This changes with uh, with that. That is not just a missile system, it's also a radar system. And it makes, and it can make you see missiles and stuff come more quickly. So it's more like, oh, that's a nuclear weapon. Boom, we have to counterattack. A mutual assured destruction works in very specific circumstances. You have nuclear weapons which are just verboten. And it's actually one of the things that concerns scientists with um, America uh, this month announced it has new smaller tactical nuclear missiles. And it's like, oh great, let's make nuclear war easier to start. Mutual assured destruction works on the thing that like nuclear weapons are so bad that we're both too scared to use it. If we both use nuclear weapons, if you win, you still lose. Like everything's irradiated. So you need that you need to have equal information. You can't have somebody be secret. If somebody has things you're doing in secret, or if somebody has an advantage and they know more, they're more likely to make the first strike. You want equality of information. You want both to be in that league of nuclear weapons, and then everyone's like, okay, let's not use them. But unfortunately, that's, that might be the age of mutual assured destruction. might be going away. I'm, I'm very worried. That's something I'm very worried about. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the, uh, the incident with the Chang'an ship happened on the northern limit line. 
A lot of Green Conservatives had banged on about this, um, and they said, oh, you know, Nomi Han, Nomi Han, oh man, he's like, he's not very good. I mean, he, was, he might have just been acknowledging reality, and we don't know exactly what Nomi Han said, because this has been a debate in politics, like what he said in his communications with North Korea, what he said to me. But here's another note line. This cuts off North Korea from a, a lot of fishing. And it's also, it's also very strange because South Korea says, we have a special agreement. We're Korean. We're special. We're the only country that's divided. No, China is in the same exact situation. We're the only country. Only, it's, like, oh, it's almost like America talking, how they're so exceptional, so special. It's different. Um, both the DPRK and the RRK are, are UN are, you, are members of the UN, and according to the UN Convention a Law of the Sea, uh, you should get 12 miles, 12 nautical miles, or 22 kilometers around all your land, as strictly yours, uh, limited sovereignty up to 44 kilometers, and you should have economic access within 200 kilometers. So basically, this Northern Limit Line, if North Korea is, you know, is attacking, like the China ship is up, it's because there's no there's no really mutual agreement on the Northern Limit Line. It's something that North Korea has tacitly accepted because they haven't been able to fight back. Uh, but it's something that's been declared unilaterally uh, by the US and the ROK. This line is just asking for trouble. It's almost like a stranglehold. They don't have access to very much here. They, they're not given what is owed to them according to the UN. Because if they're a UN member, they're, as the UN, a legitimate state, which means they're entitled to um, 12 kilometers no one else, 22, limited stop chain, 200 miles uh, or 370 kilometers of economic access. Um, as far as China, um, China, you know, oh man, it's the big giant. Oh, God, China's growing. But as far as China qualitatively, as far as its military policy goes, how belligerent it is, how militaristic it is, uh, it's, it's been well below the US. So military expenditures as a share of GDP. China's military growth has been directly correlated with its economy. And as I've said, that I don't really have time to get into, China has been growing, but they predicted um, that China would keep growing like this 10 years ago. China's growth is more like, ooh, this now. Uh, you, you just see last uh, this month, the stock market crashed. It's been, this science has been there for a couple of years though. If you follow economic, the newspapers. China's been in trouble for a while they're keeping. So they haven't been seeking a bigger military. It's just been the military has grown in size and capacity only as much as the economy has. Um, now for the North Korea, South Korea tensions, what's the cause of that? Because uh, OPCON coming to America, OPCON being in American hands, is supposedly supposed to tame North Korea. But the thing was that They've always had, America has had control over the South Korean forces since 1950. So that hasn't successfully deterred any, any of the incidents in 2010. And they say, oh, the sunshine policy, Kim Dae Jun, Nomi Han, their heads in the sky, they fail. The sunshine policy failed. Uh, there was the anything but row policy started by email box. But let's, let's, look at, let's look at what happened. This is the exchange between uh, North and South Korea. There is exchange between North Korea and China, mainland China. Look at it skyrocket. Now, this is right when you in Bok takes office. It doesn't grow or keep up with that. It goes and plummets. So, if you want North Korea to have a reason to not attack you, maybe entering your con entering the economy would be good. If North Korea, if North Korea doesn't do much exchange with you, it doesn't lose much by foreign relations. You need to give them something to lose. When North Korea has nothing to lose, you can expect bad behavior. You can expect them to have tam tantrums. North Korea is not going to do anything that's going to, like, they're not going to go against China. They are so dependent on China that they are not going to cross China. But they're not really dependent on South Korea. It's starting to get better again with Bak Bin She's, I'll give her some credit there. But South, North Korea is like, okay, whatever, close gates on. Whatever. You're not China. China is their lifeline, not South Korea. So they have no reason to, to, you know, they can risk it. They don't have any reason to protect it. Uh, you also see the number of meetings um, between the two sides have plummeted. Here is uh, the end of the sunshine period. So you've got sunshine, um, 
2001 and 2002. So tiny period. And then whoop. And then, you know, and then you wonder why relations sour. Like I said, Bakken Hay started to uh, improve things a bit. I'll give her some credit there. So this one back up. Um, Bush to Obama. Uh, Obama has been uh, doing his fifth Asia because East Asia has become so important in the in the world economy. Bush and the Republicans that he was lined with, his father McCain, they were big on Middle Eastern oil, but the Democrats had been more forward thinking. In the 1990s, they wanted to expand NATO to Eastern Europe, and I talked about that in my last lecture um, with their involvement in Yugoslavia, and the Democrats. Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton now, and uh, Obama, they're big on East Asia, Carrie. Why? Because East Asia is a much bigger prize now. It's got way more people, and we're going to have to move out to oil eventually. So oil is important, but like, it's not the end, end all be all. And the Middle East has been a disaster. America has not been able to get what it wants very effectively. I mean, you look at ISIS, just disaster. Um, so Obama had his surge here. Surge. Which, another lecture, is not very effective. But, you know, it's all going to drum up the troops to end the Afghan war and then pull out. And very quickly, well, wow, he started to pull out. And that's to free up troops to move in other places. Afghanistan and Iraq together, you look them together, <whistles> consistent here, from the start of Obama totally from the Middle East to uh, Afghanistan. The troops going away. Why? More troops moving in other places. Officially, America has few troops in Korea, but that's because they, um, they don't count these troops, because America's like, oh, these troops, oh, they're only here for 10 months, and then we switch them. If you are a soldier, now, if you are a soldier in Korea, if you're an American soldier in Korea, and you're not here from January 1st to December 31st, you're not in Korea, you're not stationed in Korea. It has to be exactly January to December, or it doesn't count. So if America just shuffles the soldiers quickly, they can say this, but then Kerry or someone else in press releases will like bl uh, blur the, the real number, which is much higher. So uh, these these troop numbers are going back to where they were at the start of the Bush years. Um, the missile defense. I'll wrap up with the missile defense here. Uh, there's there's been a general containment policy uh, by Obama to contain Russia and China, and we're seeing it's like deja vu with 1950s Cold War. And the thing is, oh, that will be able to detect North Korean missile and get it out of the sky. Uh, these missile systems aren't aren't uh, aren't that great. Uh, there's a book by Rebecca Slayton of uh, of MIT, and there've been a lot of uh, computer and missile experts, and scientists who have said that these systems they, they 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 can't work. There's so many ways to outsmart them. You can have decoy missiles. You can have a balloon around the missile. There are so many ways to get around these systems. Uh, and these systems have to work flawlessly. There's no way to test them because they have to test against every possible scenario that you can't know. And I said, you need to have symmetry of information. Uh, they call it missile defense. They're not going to call it a missile offense system because no one, no one likes that. Missile defense. Oh, defense. What a great word. Everyone likes that. Uh, this wouldn't be able, uh, there's a guy, Theodore Apostol. I highly recommend reading his works, Theodore Apostol. Uh, the, the system would not be able to protect South Korea from a North Korean attack. It's also, and this is what worries China, it lets America see 2,000 kilometers within China. So it gives America a huge advantage in, uh, in, in seeing what China's capabilities are. And this is eroding, this would erode mutually assured, uh, mutually assured deterrence. This system may not be able to stop a first strike, but it may be able to stop a second strike. If I'm America and and I attack I attack your table, let's say you are nuclear missile, nuclear missile, nuclear missile. I make the first attack, I attack. This base gone, this base gone. But there's one base left. Okay, you're gonna counterattack me? Well guess what? I got my missile defense. If all three of you attack me, I can't stop that. But if only one of you attacks me with missile defense, I might be able to stop that. So missile defense is actually not defense, it's about making so that I can attack you first, and you can't counterattack me. It may not even do that, but it has the image. And China and a lot of scientists think that. Some scientists think that it may not work even then, but it may appear to work. 
So what it does is it makes it easier for you to start an attack. Because I can make an attack, and then my missile defense can block your weak counterattack. But if you make a first strike, I can't stop that. It's impossible. But now I have this. So this creates a lot of worry for China, that America may want to have the ability to do the first strike capability. And again, this all comes down to uh, mutual deterrence. And, and Ameri when America has OPCON, that means they get to control that. That means there would be American uh, people operating. Because whenever America does missile defense things, they're very big on Americans controlling it. So it means that Americans have their fingers over the trigger. Uh, if America hands over OPCON, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. So America wants to be in control. It wants to be in East Asia. It doesn't care about Iraq anymore. Now it's looking at Asia and says, hey, you know, we can control all the Korean army. We have to stay in Korea. Eh, who cares? Bush was like, I want to pull out of South Korea. I want to pull out and go to Iraq and Afghanistan. And if he pulls out a lot, then Korea's like, hey, you can't pull out and keep OPCON. So Bush is like, yeah, if I pull out, then I have to give up OPCON. Whatever, I don't care. You can have your OPCON. Obama's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's stay, in, let's stay in Asia. Let's, uh, let's set up camp here. And again, it comes down to pushing that, uh, being against the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank, being for the TBP. This is, this is one part of uh, Obama's pivot to Asia. And I'm running out of time, so I'll stop there. Do you need to uh, go to PowerPoint? Okay.